excited to have all of you here today, and it's a real pleasure to bring another member of our nonprofit Kansas City community and an associate with the Midwest Center on some of our projects to deal with, uh, to offer today's session, Communicating in Times of Crisis. Today's session is facilitated, presented by um, Janine Ron, who is a senior fellow at the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership. She is a consultant, independent consultant, working um, particularly but not limited to health organizations and youth serving organizations. Um, Janine's firm now is uh, focusing on strategic positioning, marketing, and organization development. Her firm is called Ron and Partners, and uh, she works with a variety of nonprofit organizations. Janine has an exceptional career in executive leadership. For those of you who don't know of her, she um, has worked in healthcare, education, children's social welfare. She's recently been consulting with um, resource folks in both the states of, um, of um, Kansas and Missouri. Sorry, I got distracted by Kim Carroll's advice for Cindy on how to <laughs> avoid shoppers. <coughs> um, the, um, but she's right. So uh, Janine was uh, CEO of Crittenden for several years, very creative, developed some very useful uh, new programs. She's a real innovative thinker. And she says that she has had to think through how you communicate well and effectively in a time of crisis. And I said, oh yeah, how about sharing that with the community? And she said, sure. So no further ado, Janine, it's great to have you with us this morning. Well, thank you, Dave. It's not every day I get, you know, a musical lead in and, and such a kind introduction. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm excited to be participating today in the navigation series because it's all about embracing change and definitely embracing changes uh, where we're at and what you need to be able to do quickly in a time of crisis. Um, so it seems timely and, and I am excited to share what, what I've um, learned over the years. Hopefully what we're doing is to, to share some strategies that can help you to prepare um, to make the best decisions possible to be able to really position your organization and the people in your organization with strength um, at a time that might feel um, a little bumpy. <laughs> and, and when you're talking about crisis, crisis is a big word, um, but when you're talking about it, you, you kind of got to know it when you see it. Uh, because sometimes if you miss it, you end up in a bigger crisis. <laughs> and so I thought I would start just by giving a few examples of crisis situations that I have um, been at the helm of trying to uh, to work with, they all have a little bit of different complexion. You know, some are um, intensely private and there might even be laws about that, like HIPAA health laws or employee relations laws or um, something that is proprietary to your organization, um, or they could be wide open in the public um, and, and happening all around us, um, might be internal to your organization um, those kinds of crises have um, uh, as great a need for leadership and for um, attention as the big public things that, that could splash us on the, on the evening news. Um, some examples, what's a crisis, right? Um, May 27, 1993, I will Never forget that date <laughs> because that was the date that our life flight crashed on the way from Bethany, Missouri back to um, St. Luke's Hospital. And um, that's an example of a crisis where there's a big event, it happens. And, uh, you know, then, then there you are in the aftermath. And in the case of something big like that, the aftermath goes on sometimes for years. So what you do at the beginning Makes a, makes a lot of difference about how bumpy it is um, throughout the years. It might be um, um, a lost three-year-old child. We had that um, happen in the midst of thousands of people coming to see the Santa train at Union Station and dad thought mom had her and mom thought dad had her and nobody had her. <laughs> and she was in the midst of that crowd and how do you find that child? Or it might be um, a purposeful explosion three, three doors down with a sniper when the EMTs and, and fire trucks 
arrive and and having that sort of neighbor that day was not what we were looking to. How do you manage that? Um, so this is what we're going to be talking about. What is a crisis and um, the steps? We'll be really talking about process here. Some uh, steps throughout the arc of the crisis that help you and, and position you for strength both in the moment and going forward. <clears throat> So here you are, you're in the storm. <laughs> You've determined we are in crisis, okay? What is this? This is a high threat event, okay? And the implications can be really great. Um, and it can be the threat of serious impact or it can actually have, have occurred like in a life flight crash where um, it did involve death and serious physical injury. Um, it might be a psychological event. Um, but, but you've got something that is immediate that is now demanding your attention. Okay. And um, I, I always start going back to my healthcare days and I think of it like a pain scale. Where are we at on this pain scale? And you know, a 10 is this is life-threatening and or this could put us out of business. And a one is obviously the opposite of that. And you've got your variations and your gradations in between. But I, I immediately go to my head on, okay, what level are we talking about here? And then we start to, to discern what type of crisis do I have? So what is the breadth of this and how deep does it go? And in, when you're thinking about how broad is this, it's um, what is the reach? Okay, is this something that it will be internal to our organization? Will this be local to our community? Could this have regional legs or, oh my gosh, is this going national? And, you know, I would say at this point in our social media world that almost anything has the potential to go national. <laughs> so, so that heightens the level of your threat. Um, and you want to discern, okay, how broadly, how deep into this are we? And then what is the level of harm that has occurred or that could occur? And, and what is the potential for this, this harm to, to, occur, to occur? Sorry. So you've figured out, okay, I'm an eight on the scale, and this is a national scope, and don't go it alone. <laughs> Now's the time to connect with people in your, your organization, maybe in the community, who are um, there to help you in the moment. Okay? Um, some, some of that is just a, a straightforward, hey, heads up, this is happening. And some is, we need to rally, this is happening. And there's some of this that you can do um, in advance. So I really highly recommend in, an, in any organization that you have um, a card or a cheat sheet with your phone tree and your, your internal organizational phone tree that would be um, listing who is notified in case of what type of event is happening here, along with a current, current being the operative word, cell phone number for that person. And I keep those, those cheat sheets in my car, in my home, and in my office. And um, it saves you a ton of time when the unexpected happens, or, you know, as they say, it will happen. <laughs> so be, be prepared in that way. So now I'm aware, right? I got a problem. I started rallying the crowd. The next thing you want to do is get to the scene and you're going to stay on the scene. And this is really about um, thinking clearly and being present so that you can model the responses that you want others to take forward into the organization that day. This is a whole, um, you, you now have this most remarkable team building opportunity <laughs> and we don't want to squander it. So um, you're going to be setting the tone and you're gonna be setting the structures. And Dave mentioned some of the, the programmatic work that I've done and, and much of that was around trauma. 
And um, this, take a deep breath, I used to joke, I teach people how to breathe. Yes, in fact, it physiologically is really an important thing to do. So you're gonna breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth and truly take a deep breath because it will help you to think more clearly. And then, then we get to the work of it, right? We're gonna start in, by immediately advancing our boundaries. We need to contain our site. We wanna create our communications hub and we, we wanna to get to our employees and our internal audiences before other people do, right? Um, so when I'm thinking about boundaries, I'm thinking of this in a couple of ways. I'm thinking it about the physical facility and the physical site of wherever the incident is. And this is um, necessary. You're going to be thinking in terms of safety. You're going to be thinking in terms of privacy and just plain uh, creating a, a tamp down on <clears throat> could be a chaotic kind of a situation. So um, the, other, the other way to set a boundary is to set a boundary with regard to the media that is, is now gathering <laughs> for your crisis. Okay? In, in the moment first, I, I consider, is this going to be a broadcast worthy electronic media event? meaning radio, television, social media, or is this going to be a nothing burger? <laughs> um, it could go either way, but you, you want to uh, be sure to, to manage your media well. When you've got a big something on site, okay, um, you want to be clear with television crews photographers where you want them to be and so it is not out of bounds for you to say you know I need you to go to the public spaces at the end of the driveway our staff need to come and go remember that the number one group that we're taking care of here is our staff we don't want you know a, what do you think about this or what have you been told microphone in their face as they're walking in or out that happens <laughs> um, we also want uh, emergency personnel to be able to come and go if it's that kind of a situation. Um, so again, safety and privacy, how do we create the lanes that we need to create? And, and sometimes media is intimidating. This is not the time to be uh, shy. This is the time to just say, I will come to you. We will bring you the information that we have. Um, here's how to reach me, make sure they have that. But move and create your own perimeter. Okay. Um, there's another thing that you can do in advance that gives me great comfort at these sorts of times, and that is to have an established media policy for your staff um, to follow so that they know if they pick up the phone and it's somebody asking questions about what's going on, who gets that call, um, so that they know um, this is not the time to pick up your phone and start tweeting. Um, so, so that you have in advance set the expectations for how communications will occur in your organization in all times, including times of crisis. And so having that media policy is a really good idea. So a communications hub it sounds very... Uh, official. Uh, the purpose here is to create a quiet space, a space where people can think, where you can organize, where if you're going to be um, interfacing with reporters, uh, where you can take the person who may or may not um, be familiar with how to approach the media and prepare their questions, help them, and um, it's just a private spot to to be able to think. Um, this is particularly important if you're going to have an event that, that you know is going to last throughout the whole morning or throughout um, the week. <laughs> it, it depends uh, on the scope of your, of your 
issue, but it's a good idea to have this private space. You want it to be as physically close as you can get really to what's happening, but away and out of the day-to-day -day business traffic. So what your, your goal is for the normal business and the course of um, clients coming and going and the service that we are providing, you want not to interrupt all of that, um, but you want to be close to what's happening. You want a space that's um, large enough for about six to eight people. That's in my um, experience about how many people could be there um, at any given time. <laughs> and they need a, enough room to spread out. They're going to put their laptop down. They're going to have papers on either side. They're going to have their water bottle, um, you know, and they need a little bit of space. And this was, we needed that even before social distancing <laughs> on this, but, but that might be, be aware of um, the kind of physical space that people need to be comfortable and to be doing their best work. You want access to restrooms. <laughs> you want to be able to um, provide food and beverages if this goes on so that people can think clearly and not have to be worrying about, you know, running out for lunch and what's our order. And you no, know, we want to be focused on what is happening at hand. And then the, the logical thing um, about having strong internet connectivity where you are, outlets um, being accessible for all of the electronics that we bring with us, having power strips available and, and there for the taking um, quickly is a good thing to do in advance. Um, and some means of real-time monitoring of the media that may be occurring. So, um, give you an example. <laughs> there, there are multiple buildings on the campus that I was working. In one of those buildings, 5.30 in the morning, there were two staff members and they came in early and they left early um, every day. And on this day, they were coming in together and unfortunately encountered a vagrant who had um, broken in and had been resting and they startled him um, and then, you know, did what many of us would do, get out, get out, and he was immediately threatened. What ensued after that was a, a pretty ugly tussle. Uh, one of the women was injured pretty seriously and we took her away in an ambulance um, and uh, he, ran, he ran off. Um, this was occurring, uh, I realized, <laughs> as I was getting out of my shower at 545 and um, the phone was ringing. That's never a good sign. And here's what's happening, Janine. We've called the police, but, you know, as soon as you call the police, this goes out on the squawk box and all the media will be here. And, and that is true. So knowing the time <laughs> of of day when this is happening, uh, sometimes are more busy than others. And, um, and some of those busy times internally might be shift change, which this was coming up on shift change, um, might be um, morning news. I mean, we were hitting it just as they were checked in, ready to go. And oh my goodness, now we've got a story. And, and literally by the time I got there, all of those TV trucks were there with their antennas up. And um, so how, again, how to contain all of that, how to, how to uh, understand what's happening, how to get close to that, how to protect your employees. These are the things that are going through your mind. And um, you need this quiet place, your, your communications hub to be able to say uh, to others and provide good direction to people um, that is a place where we, we um, have authorized personnel only. It's a no media zone. We don't bring any reporters in. It's a private space. I dwell on this only because um, if it is chaotic outside, it is helpful for those of us who need to think about how are we going to communicate this and how are we going to dispatch people to have a quiet place to do that. One thing that I do on the outside of that door is to put um, usually some sort of a color, like a big green um, piece of construction paper or something 
because uh, your receptionist may need to to let people know this is where you can go. Go down to the such and such a room. There's you know the one with the green paper on the door, um, and just a little note on that that says private, and and that gen generally does it. Let me um, pause a little minute here and talk about um, media training. In a crisis, um, depending on where the breach has occurred for your organization, there may be people who are not normally in front of a camera or talking to media who are the experts that will do the best job for your organization of explaining what has just happened. And so it's a good idea um, as a part of an annual or every 18 months kind of an event, depending on the um, turnover in your organization, to have a half a day of media training and just some awareness building, if nothing else, among those in your leadership team who may be called on to speak. And it's another way to, to be prepared and to not feel flat-footed in the moment of a crisis. Okay, so you're, you're aware, you're on the scene, and you're all set up. Now we're gonna talk about who do we, who do we talk to first. As nonprofit organizations, we are most often service oriented. We are service providers. That means that it's all about the people. <laughs> um, our staff are job one. And we really need to think about this in terms of our employee safety and in terms of employee morale. Um, these are our number one asset, right? So, they can help us, they can disseminate messages internally to the organization or sometimes externally at our direction. Uh, we need them relaxed, we need them um, attuned to how and where to get their messages. Um, and one of the things that I really feel strongly about is that I, I look to the highest level spokesperson in, in the organization. This is somebody who is familiar to people um, in all times, this is somebody who can provide confidence that, yes, in fact, we're on the job and we know what's going on, and that the message to your employee base is, okay, this is the full weight of the organization that is now behind this response, and they, there's like a, an inaudible collective deep breath <laughs> that occurs at that point. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, this will allow you to be consistent. Um, we don't want to pull the CEO in and then have them leave to go to a, um, you know, a business meeting out of town. <laughs> That's the wrong message. Here it is, all is well, I'm out of here. I've, I've had that happen. <laughs> So learn, learn from that mistake, um, but go to somebody who can be consistent throughout the course of the situation and who is well known and carries the weight of your organization, a credible source. Um, one employee I would like to call out as absolutely key, somebody who needs your direct attention, eyeball to eyeball, person to person in a quiet space, and that is the person who is sitting at your front desk, who is greeting visitors, who is answering the phone. They need to be provided on the front end with a, a cheat sheet, even if you're handwriting it. If you get a question, here's my cell phone. Here's the number to the room that we've just set up. Send it in. You don't have to answer that. Um, as guests arrive, you know, tell them what you want them to say, tell them um, how to handle this, and, and they will settle in and do it. This is what they do all day long, greet people and, and share messages. But uh, to leave them outstanding 
leaves you kind of wide open to, well, I don't really know. And yeah, I heard about that. And they're also social people <laughs> and they talk and, and converse in that way. And so um, really helping, helping your frontline receptionist to do the best job um, they can is important in, to success for the organization in this. This is something um, that, again, can be prepared ahead of time. This can be um, considered as a part of staff orientation, not just for that one position, but for any position that has a public facing kind of an uh, information. So, so that we talk like right from the beginning about here, here it is, this is the all glowing, wonderful way that we operate. And when things don't go well, here's what we do together. So that message can be set at the, at the start in your um, orientation processes. Um, the clarity of your internal messaging is really important as well. So as the CEO of an organization, I almost always assessed the situation, made sure that I had safety and um, comfort for the employees who were present and involved. And then the next phone call I made was my board chair. And as quickly as all of that can be established, the best. If it's gonna be a little while before you can do that, then that's when you reach out to your assistant or somebody else in your senior leadership team and say, go call the chair, tell them this is happening, it's under control, I will be calling them shortly. But one way or the other, no surprises with our board is a, a really good important goal. <laughs> And also to give them a role, particularly if it's a big event. Um, that sniper event that I referenced, that was real. That was three doors down, a fellow who was unstable, who um, lit his home and his backyard shed on fire. There were explosives in the shed. And so, you know, we could hear the popping on that and we heard the fire trucks, this is great. We had 52 children, 12 and under, <laughs> playing outside. This was May. Um, we had to bring them all in and didn't quite know what was going on. And then we heard the gunshots. And that was what he was doing as, as the uh, emergency teams were uh, arriving. He did in fact hit a paramedic. She has recovered well, but it was an immediate event. So talk about, you know, set your perimeter, uh, figure out a safe place for everybody in your building. It also happened to be board day. <laughs> and so this was happening late in the afternoon as my board members were arriving. We had to quickly, for those who were already on premise, say the police have told us you can't leave. <laughs> we'll give you a job. And um, the first job they had was call the other board members who aren't here yet tell them to turn around, tell them that we've got it under control and that we're, that we're going ahead. Um, and, and it's not uncommon for me to say to the board chair when I'm talking with them, I'm gonna get you a written couple of paragraphs about what's happening. It's something you can email out to everybody, let them know we've talked, please tell them I'll keep you all apprised. That is so much preferred to um, reading it on the news or having, you know, your spouse called to say, hey, did you hear what's happening? And, um, and to have them wondering, we don't want them wondering. In the, in the case of, um, of our sniper incident, um, I put the board in the conference room and I had them start to call parents and let them know that, that it was okay, parents or guardians of the kids, um, let the uh, licensing staff know that we were all okay that they were going to hear about that on the news as they were driving home that night but but we're fine and um that gave them something to do but board is an important thing not to forget here um when i talk about volunteers i'm not talking about the people who come and wrap gifts once a year i'm talking about that person who comes every wednesday and spends half a day sorting and, and managing your library or the people who are coming and have other operational um, regular roles, I treat them and I lump them together just like the employees. Um, so 
how do you position that? All right, gang, here it is. Um, this is our new assignment today. This is what's happening, and, and it is now a part of our day. What we are always wanting, of course, is the um, most uh, <clears throat> normal <laughs> to continue as we can. So any way that, um, that we can keep things running smoothly while somebody else, you, are managing the crisis, the better, all right? So helping people to know our normal jobs are essential. Um, they are uh, an important part. We must continue to do what we do and, you know, please do that. Those are productive messages to, to get to people and get to people quickly. And, um, and then providing direction to them. Uh, mm -hmm. We will share information through the communications team. Let's remember what we learned in orientation. Uh, our number one goal is to be uh, accurate and to be timely with what we share with you. We will certainly do that. You will know what we know when we know it. Back to you soon. Please, please go forward and do your normal work. And that is, is, in my experience, usually enough to help people to understand that just by doing my normal routine, I am really contributing here. And um, so uh, calming your staff is an important piece and making sure that they understand it, including your board, very important. All right. So we're aware, we're on the scene, we're setting our hub, we've got our internal audience taken care of. Now we gotta think about, all right, what is our messaging gonna be? And um, as I just mentioned, accuracy, timeliness, relevant to what you're talking about, those are always good communications uh, tools to rely on. Uh, here, you wanna define your audience, all right? So each, nonprofit organization has its own distinct um, set of stakeholders and the people that you relate to. This is a good, another in advance kind of a thing that you can do. And I put this little graphic up here because um, it's just one way to visualize how and who we relate to. And, and you look here and, and let's talk about the importance of all of those. We've already talked about board and staff and, and our clients the same sort of safety and, um, and calm for our clients as for um, the staff that we have here. The volunteers, we're just circling around here. Government officials, why would we call government officials? <laughs> well, we might call government officials because they are the people who come in and audit us uh, and make sure that we have our license you know, intact and the licensing professionals are really going to be interested that things are under control and that it's all going well. Um, you want to let them know that proactively. Um, you might want to let the people in the streets department know, okay, we've shut it down from here to here. Um, and, you know, can you help us? Again, going back to setting your perimeter, can you help us? Uh, to set a perimeter so that our key staff can get in and out, but it's closed to the public. Um, there's any number of, of um, government supports that you may need. Take a little time and, and think about what, what might that be? What could happen on our premise or for our organization? Excuse me, talking about allergies. Right. <laughs> um, that that we might need help from our government resources. Funders, uh, these are the people who are keenly interested in our organization. They want it to go well for us and, and sometimes it's appropriate to let them know um, what's happening in the in the real time and sometimes it's the follow-up a little bit later but who what would be your hierarchy of funders and who would you contact and and explain to them, here's what's happening, here's what, what we, how we responded, and this was what we learned about that situation, so that they are understanding that you see them as partners and that you understand that they are a stakeholder in your organization. 
industry peers. Um, this is really helpful. These are the people who do what you do or something similar to what you do, where you have those professional relationships where you might want to rely on that. So if you were to, um, uh, one thing we always prepared for was if we needed to evacuate our building, where would we go? You know, this is an industry peer kind of a thing where you know who you're gonna pick up the phone and call and say, um, can we have your gym tonight? <laughs> I have 50 kids to, to put to bed and you know the tornado just blew the roof off my building um, or the flood is coming or whatever it might be. That's actually um, actually happened uh, to another organization and they ended up in our gym uh, because their property backed up to a stream and somebody's propane tank had fallen into the stream <laughs> and was coming that direction. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, right? And and you just have to say, oh, yes, it's real. <laughs> and come on down. And and so who would we go to and in what kinds of situations? Those are good to, um, to think through in advance uh, so you're not on the spot. Janine, just because you brought up tornadoes, I'm going to throw in a question here. So what about... Um, when sort of you have all these plans in place, you've talked about, you know, having policies and establishing those ahead of time. What about when you do like lose communication because of a tornado or something like that? And I'm going to pass it over actually to, um, to Kim at Heart to Heart because she asked the question and you guys kind of may have more knowledge about that same page for her to give you more details. But sometimes those backup systems that you have that you have down to, to work with don't work anymore. And so how do you kind of prepare for that? So I'm going to send it over to Kim to sort of add to what I just asked, okay? Well, I'll be very interested yes. in what Janine's done when she's experienced that. I, what we do is probably overkill for what an average organization would do because that's kind of what we do day in and day out. So we, we actually have satellite capabilities. I think the key is, and Janine, you spoke to this, if everybody knows where to go, even if you yeah. can't reach me by cell, this is physically where you need to be because it doesn't have to damage the towers for you to lose cell access. What happens is everybody's texting pictures of the damage or, you know, photos of, you know, their home and it, it'll overwhelm the, the geography. You can't actually communicate. So I, I think the point you made about having a pre-identified meet location and tell everyone, even if you can't reach me, that's where you go. Like, don't, yes. they shouldn't wait, they yes. shouldn't wait and, to get called. Correct. Um, so you've touched on some really important pieces here, like what if the infrastructure is, is damaged, is falling apart. And um, uh, old school <laughs> is what I have done in situations like that. A landline is a really good thing and it tends to be more stable than, than our cellular communications at that time. Um, I, uh, knowing, just knowing and having that day-to-day uh, -day expectation in your organization of we are an organization of action. We, if you see something, you don't wait and think that some manager is going to cover it. You get on it. And, and that is everybody's part. And that's a part of organization. That's a part of um, overall leadership and, and um, preparing your organization to do their best at all times. Um, but, but I agree with you. Um, very important that people continue forward, know what they need to do, and... Um, you know, fortunately, I, I think of the Joplin tornado, and I was working in healthcare at the time. And so um, allowing others to carry your message, it, it is, I've never been in a situation personally where we've been totally cut off. Um, and so it, the messaging might be delayed, but getting it out to people who are outside of the perimeter of what has, of the damage, and, and letting them do some of the communicating for you was very, very effective at that time. And relying um, back to our industry peers on associations that you have with those who, who may be able to help um, 
is is really important. In those situations, um, you know, keeping those who are in the building, if it's happening to you um, and you have uh, people who are you are caring for 24 seven kind of congregate care or a medical situation that they are your first first concern and keeping them safe and moving them to safety and and all of what you need to do in that event um, is something that as a communications team I've spent a lot of time talking about the media but you also turn inward and help people to connect with one another and help departments be able to um, pull it together and coordinate in order to bring all of the strengths of your resources up to bear yeah, until another, everybody is in a spot. Comment, uh, and this was a practice I changed after 9-11 because I, I saw the towers from my office is, and we had people in the air uh, en route back from Europe who wound up sitting in Greenland is everyone must put every flight number uh, and every hotel and hotel phone number on their calendar with uh, me having access to at least that much. Um, because uh, when big events like that happen, uh, people's spouses pick up the, so it's not just notifying your employee but, and your board, but also the families uh, of the people that are affected. That's right, thank you, great point. Somebody else had their hand raised, I could see, but is there another question? Marvin has his hand raised. Uh, Marvin, you want to unmute yourself and raise your question? Uh, can you hear me? Good morning. I, I lost the uh, audio right around 9.05, but I'm absolutely loving the um, how to handle a crisis. Uh, because I, the project I'm working on is like, it lives in crisis. <laughs> and so this is really uh, uh, quite excellent. I did hit the record so I could play it later. But um, say for example, when our effort gets to a point and we need to have greater community uh, involvement, or you or someone inside the nonprofit center there going to be available to come and help walk through uh, people that are nearly as aware of how we need to keep going forward. Does that make sense? I'm not sure that I'm tracking exactly. You're... Say it again. Uh-oh. I'm not sure that I was understanding Marvin's question. Well, Janine, we should probably keep going since we do have a 9.30 stop and I know you do have a little bit more content to share. Yeah, and okay. I'll, yeah. We'll follow up with Marvin. He, he may be asking what the Midwest Center is able to offer in terms of uh, some additional support uh, organization by organization basis. I'll follow up with him on that. Yeah, okay. One more point before I leave this slide, and that is on the integration of the messages and then um, uh, bridging that to what is normal to the employee themselves. So typically you're going to come up with two or three core messages um, that, that you want people to know, and then maybe one or two items that uh, are specific to, to a specific work environment or specific to the board and what they can do or specific to um, the general public message that you want out there. But those two or three messages, you will get tired of saying those. It will feel repetitive to you. It is not. It is um, new to people and, and important and to have the, that consistent messaging that where everybody, all audiences are getting the same thing and then adding to that to specific um, directed audiences has been a really uh, great uh, strategy, effective strategy. So in communications, we talk about tell people what you're gonna tell them, 
say it, and then tell them what you just said. <laughs> and talk about repetitive. That does feel repetitive, but uh, it is a strategy and it is important to make sure that you are getting through. Now is not the time for creativity. <laughs> you are going to, to stick to the facts and yes, less is more. And I will, I will tell you, um, everyday language is really the best. Uh, that life flight crash, I had a guy from the helicopter company come to me all upset because I was calling it a crash. And um, please don't say that on TV anymore. And I said, well, what should I say? And he said, um, well, tell them that it impacted the ground. And I said, it didn't impact the ground. <laughs> the impact was to the people. The impact was to the service. And, you know, no. Stick to the everyday language that people know and be real with what it is. Um, and acknowledge what you don't know. We're unsure about this and this and this yet. That helps people to know that you've got the big picture in mind, even if you don't have all the answers. And let them know what's evolving and about how quickly you think um, that, that that might um, happen, all right? So that you can establish a schedule and, and say, we don't anticipate knowing anything for a couple of hours here, we'll be back to you at that time. So that they know you intend to continue that dialogue with, with your key audiences. And I always, always, always ensure that there are at least two sets of eyes on anything written, um, whether it's a script or whether it's a release or anything that you're sending out there um, before you put it out there. When misinformation occurs, inadvertent or otherwise, um, you end up now having to spend time on that as well. And not only does that create a little bit of shakiness depending on how big a breach that was, but um, you don't wanna spend your time following your own mistakes. You want to spend your time on the process at hand. One thing that I do when I'm writing that, that, that is also helpful, you're moving fast, you'll put something down, you'll think, oh, I don't really need this, I don't really need this, I just want to say this at this time. Um, take those things that you're editing out of whatever it is you're writing, put them on what I call a dump sheet, other people call it other stuff, but just cut and paste it onto a piece of paper because you'll need to get to that detail a little bit later and then you won't have to think that through again, you'll have already done it. So um, working in the real time, thinking ahead and um, acknowledging for people, um, you know, that you're a part of this and we will be back to you and in including them in the communications is all um, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so tell people when it's over, okay, this is done. And here's how we know it, okay? And, and that here's how we know it is an important part of that message. And alternatively, um, if it's not over, this stage is over, it's under control, we're going to have continued challenges in this way, we collectively are up to the job, that might be we the community, that might be we our organization, that might be we our leadership team and board, but we can do this and then come the thank yous and the thank yous need to be specific here's what you saw that was helpful to the organization mm -hmm. the collaboration between these two departments that was stellar give them the ex specific example about who did what to make it happen and just use a couple two three of those and then express your thanks to everybody way to pull together this is this is what we are about and we're still breathing, right? <laughs> it's very important to continue <clears throat> to breathe. Um, because you're not done. <laughs> Telling stories is really innate to human interaction. And you've now got an important story to share. So think about that story arc. It always starts once upon a time. We were just going about our daily business. And then this happened. And then this. And then this. And then we did that. And hopefully we all live happily ever after, right? So that's kind of the really condensed story arc here. You can use those inside. It becomes a unifying kind of a, remember about the team building here? <laughs> this is a unifying event. And you can use that to inspire. You can use that in celebration. 
um, you can use that as examples of uh, how people are particularly professional and effective in what they do. And really that this is what we're all about, you know, way to go. We celebrate that internally. You can take those hero stories externally as well to event presentations. And one thing that I like to do with the media is um, they like to do these follow-ups. Remember this big thing happened and now here's what's happening. In advance of them coming for that follow-up, I like to reach out to them in real time to say, wow, while we were all um, focused on this big part of what was happening, here's the behind the scenes couple of stories. And sometimes they'll pick up on that and that is a really positive way to feature your organization as capable, particularly if this has been really public. Um, you know, what, who are the people behind all that and what does that, how does that reflect in your organization? Um, orientation and again, professional presentation, uh, sharing with others, new lessons learned. So I'm ready to talk. <laughs> Hey, Janine, Cindy here. So um, uh, the chat's just held a few suggestions to people, so I think I'd like to have you weigh in on some of them. Um, a lot of, I think, that people are, well, some of the people on the call are kind of maybe wondering where do they start with this? Like, how do you, that preparedness thing. Um, there's been some suggestions um, about how you can have the government shut down certain phones and you can designate some phones as essential and text work better. Um, also going to your local community preparedness, you know, centers, things like that. So just kind of for, for people who are, this is wonderful news or information, but what, how do they even start? And is there some local help or where would, where would people go? I think that might've been what Marvin was going at too. So. Okay. Um, you know, these are multifaceted kinds of uh, situations and so it really falls back to the principles of strong general leadership. And you, and you know that. So the first thing to do is to know I got this, okay? <laughs> I can do this. I'm a leader and, and this is going to be the same. And then to, to be aware that these kinds of situations can occur and to begin to think in the course of, and it's a, it's a good thing just to do with your management team. Hey, you guys, let's think about what are the two or three things that might could happen that would Im impact our organization and our operations? And then what would people need to know, uh, to Kim's point, so that they can keep doing what they need to do? What would they need to know? And then think about, okay, how in the course of our regular work do we start to include those messages? So um, staff orientation, just a little component on this, um, helps to cue, cue that up in, um, you know, whatever your mechanisms are for keeping people up to date. There are um, organizations out there who will uh, help you to prepare. They tend to be um, industry specific. So there are a couple of groups that do really well in education settings and some that do really well. It's nice. Um, really well in uh, public facing kinds of environments. So it's nice to uh, find those people. I'm happy to help you find um, resources for that. Uh, that. Is somebody familiar with the work that you do? Um, when it comes to the actual messaging and the communication or media relations or what do we do about interviews, you know, nobody here is, is a communications major. Um, it is, uh, there are individuals who consult on that. There are any of the advertising and PR firms will come and help you with that. Go to your boards and ask them. Um, I mean, the first time I ever did that, I had someone on my board who was working for Sprint and they brought in people from their VCC to, you know, they do this all day, every day to help us. They are a great resource for what you might need. So I think that the thing is to remember, this is a, a leadership exercise, always crisis management, and, um, and figure out where you may have a gap in the skill set that you need and find somebody who can help you to develop that in your, in your organization. Thank you. Yeah. This has been fun. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, we can we can stick around for another minute or two if there's another question or two. But we are approaching 9:30. Um, <clears throat> we do encourage you to uh, 
Mark Culver has posted the evaluation feedback uh, for this. So please do go and give us feedback on the session and also what you'd like to see uh, in the future.